situation in uh, in Lesbos and uh, Moria, I think, as many people already already know, um, was already very very bad before coronavirus outbreak threats started. Um, we have uh, yeah around twenty thousand people now uh, stuck in Moria camp. Um, where there is a capacity for 3,000 people. And I mean, I think a lot of these statistics and numbers have already been shared, but I mean, it's important again to highlight, for example, there are there's like one tap for 1,300 people uh, today in Moria. And I think it's also useful again to give a bit also the wider, the wider context because the corona virus and the threats around it also come after which was again a very dark period in the in the island with the um, with the eruption of uh, fascist violence and very extreme violence against refugees and migrants, but also against everybody who is uh, supporting or perceived as uh, supporting uh, people on the move. The pandemic uh, threat also has huge consequences for the people who still arrive in Lesbos. Um, so now these people, uh, the people who arrive on the boats are kept separately as a corona measure, but very few people talk about the fact that these people are now kept in, uh, here in Mytilene, are basically kept in detention um, in a very small area in the port, in totally inhumane conditions. And the same happening in the in the north or worse, where people are just or sleeping in flimsy tents or literally outside sleeping on blankets, also with babies and children. So they're just abandoned. You know, Moria camp is a bit of a black box. Like it's very difficult there to scrutinize what's happening and to monitor any human rights violations. Now, because of the pandemic, Moria has gone in a total lockdown, so it's even more difficult, of course, for us to monitor what's going on. And uh, yeah, we rely on, on on people on the inside to to share to share information with us. Um, and then, of course, I mean, in this whole situation, we also shouldn't forget that um, yeah, this is the, the pandemic is not only a threat, of course, for refugees and migrants, but also for the local population. Um, and one of the things that uh, the local groups, and I'm part of a local group here, uh, try to do is, of course, to set up also local solidarity initiatives. So we are um, gathering funds also for the local hospital to help with medical, you know, basic infrastructure, um, to find ways here to support yeah, local people in need with, with food and basic things they need, uh, or elderly people who have a difficult time in, uh, in lockdown. You know, the European member states have a direct responsibility for the overcrowding in the camps. Because if you look at the backlog in family reunification over the last years, it's crazy. Many people who are here now stuck in the islands should have been with their families in Germany, in the Netherlands, you know, all over Europe a long time ago. So also in that sense, I mean, to then hear that, you know, maybe finally eight member states will take 1,600 unaccompanied minors from the islands and divide them between them, it's, it's very poor. It's, it's not enough when it's also very late. And this is also something that they basically already agreed even before the corona outbreak. You know, it's not even also in response to... To the pandemic and and i think we really have to be very clear on that that if there is or when there is an outbreak in moria camp and people will start dying and it will get very ugly there is a direct responsibility for the european union there's no other way to to put it when you work on migration for such a long time you're always dealing with the symptoms of course like it's one of the core symptoms of the capitalist system and you're just, you know, working on cosmetic changes to a broken system, which for me, it's one of the key things why I got burnt out several times. And I know that we have to zoom out and, you know, I now want to, you know, I'm talking with friends who work on universal basic income and stuff now. I think we have to, you know, we have to move to these bigger things at the same time. But at the same time, that's the thing. There's so much to do in a way. There's a pressure to like use the momentum. At the same time, we can't just be productive all the time and not realize that we are also, yeah, we need time to 
grieve, to feel sad, to feel lonely, to all of these things. There's so many humanitarian needs that a lot of the volunteers and activists here get sucked into really, you know, that first line humanitarian response. And we don't have enough energy left to think about the political struggle and, you know, the political demands that we have to make. Um, and this I find very encouraging that we have now different campaigns running, a lot of different initiatives and petitions and people also really, again, devoting energy to the, to the political struggle. We can use that, the momentum now, and try to find ways to really join forces and, and unite instead of being fragmented, you know, in our, in our different initiatives. Um, I think there's a real big opportunity, and I want to be optimistic about that, that there is a way that we can now really use that, that energy.